Well, thank you so much for coming, all of you. It's very encouraging to me to know that, uh, at least potentially, I'm not alone in finding Augustine absolutely fascinating. But I would like to start by telling you a word about why he actually really matters to all of us as Christians. Um, the, the great principle of the Church of England in all sorts of ways is all may, none must, some should. And I would say that that applies to Augustine very much. Nobody has to do it. Uh, some of us ought to do it, but all of us can investigate him if we choose to. Um, and I think it's very brave of the people organising these talks to put Augustine first, because I have to tell you, if you don't know already, he does not have the greatest reputation. I once wrote in a review of a an, an theological book um, that the writing, that, uh, writing a book called um, The Theological Perspectives of St Augustine on Feminism would be a really short story. And, <laughs> And I was challenged to write it. I haven't got around to it yet, but he doesn't come out very well from the point of view of his reputation. But I want to tell you that that is desperately unfair. Um, and not just because he wrote lovely Latin, although that is part of the, part of the reason that I think he's so special. Um, if I can start with some of the things you might know about him already. I've called him Augustine of Hippo to make sure nobody mixes him up with Augustine of Canterbury, who is the actually, I think, rather dull saint who, <laughs> who they celebrate down in Canterbury somewhere. But, um, but Augustine of Hippo is known as one of the great doctors of the church, the church's greatest theologian uh, of the Latin speaking type. There are lots of good theologians over in the East writing in Greek but uh, only Augustine in Latin um, stands out head and shoulders above the rest. Um, now, that makes him sound a little bit intimidating and also um, possibly a bit off-putting. And if that's a problem already, let me compound the problem uh, because he has a really bad reputation when it comes to talking about sex. You could say that of the church as a whole, of course, as well. Um, particular reasons are two. One is theology. He was perpetually interested in what evil is, and he was always interested in reading the opening chapters of Genesis to try and work out why. And it, he's mostly responsible for the Christian take on what happened in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve, um, because he's the person through whom we come to understand it as the fall, the fall of man, you've often heard it called. Um, and there are other ways of understanding that passage from the very beginning of the Bible, and you can ask a rabbi if you want a very different take, but Augustine's has become the norm. And that has had two really unlucky effects for uh, Christians afterwards. One is that sex has become associated with evil and sinfulness. Uh, and the other one is that human beings are helpless to do good on their own. I mean, those don't look like they go together very closely, but um, we've got a brain as big as Augustine's. Uh, it starts to make connections. So those two things are the principal reasons why people find him difficult or they put, put off by him. And you can see this at work if you take a look at the two most famous quotations that are associated with Augustine. And I have to say, if I'm talking to Christians about Augustine, I use one quotation. And if I'm talking to non-Christians, I use the other one. Um, but they all recognize them. If I'm talking to non-Christians, you won't be at all surprised to hear that the famous quotation is, Lord, make me chaste and continent, but not yet. That's the one that everybody knows if they don't go to church. If they do go to church, if you were at mass this morning, you will have heard his most famous quotation. Almighty God, you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. I have to say that um, among all the over-quoted and misunderstood passages, this is not one. It really is as beautiful and special and applicable to all of us as it sounds like. You have made us for yourself, he says to God, and our heart is restless, inquietum, unquiet, until it rests in you. I find those words very powerful and I'm not alone. So I want to talk to you a little bit about him through that reputation he has. I want to touch on the kind of theology that he did in his life because he's most famous uh, in Christianity as a doctor, a teacher in the church. 
And what that means is that he wrote a lot of extremely long books, most of which most Christians have never read. And even some academics like myself um, haven't read as many of them as we're supposed to. Uh, the biggest of the lot is called City of God, and it really is a fundamental work for European political thought because it asks, what is society? What is human society and what works for its flourishing? And how does the society we live in here on Earth relate to the one we think is going to happen to us after death? So that's one of the most famous of his theologies. And I'll say a little bit about that. Another one is his writing on the Trinity, which um, <clears throat> I haven't entirely read, I have to admit, <laughs> partly on the grounds that I find theology, proper theology with a capital T, I find it a bit dull. Um, but I do really like what I would call embedded theology, theology which grows out of people's experience and which we understand through reading about history and texts, what people said and how they said it. I don't really believe in lifting a saying out of a text and then sticking it somewhere else and doing what you like with it, which is what a lot of theology tends to do. Another thing that came to preoccupy him much later in his life, and to be honest with you, is the biggest uh, downside to enjoying Augustine is his teaching on grace, free will and predestination. You can't really understand him without getting all of that. And Augustine was somebody who, like many of us, started off believing in free will. Of course I've got free will. I chose to come here this morning um, and I chose to sit and listen to the Stravinsky Mass and the preaching and learn a bit about the Ten Lepers and you chose to come and listen to me. But there are other forces at work which we don't always choose. Why was I a Christian who wanted to come in the first place? Uh, how did I make the choices that led me to where I am today? And he, the more he struggled with it, the more he came to see that actually human freedom is a kind of illusion. And at this point, we have to put the brakes on and switch off that little element in our brains, which is the child of the Enlightenment and thinks that free will and predestination are two sides of a coin. They're just polar opposites that just are, um, because we've been brought up to believe that. Augustine didn't think like that, and nor did anybody else in his day. Not the poets, not the theologians, not the philosophers. They had a sense that you can have a human will, that's the thing by which you choose stuff. You choose to wear, I choose to wear black today because I'm doing a priestly kind of thing. Um, those are the things that you choose. But there are also things that you can't choose, like how rich your parents are. There's a really good example. Or what school they choose to send you to. Um, so in any individual human life, there are two things that go together. And we have elements of freedom and we have elements of compulsion that are not within our choice. And he thought that was obvious. I think it's obvious. Um, but for a theologian proper, sometimes that becomes an either or, and you have to choose one or the other. Um, so if you're a person who thinks you can either have free will or you can have predestination, it's all written in the stars before you're born. Um, either, either extreme gives you a problem. Saying both is quite difficult. But what he didn't chicken out of was asking the question and trying to answer it. And if you want to know what fundamentally I most think is important about Augustine, it's that he never backed away from a difficult question about God. And that, to me, is absolutely the heart of it. I mean, I love him for the beautiful words that he wrote, but most of all, I love him because he never lied to himself about what mattered. And that's very, very rare. So I want to talk about all those things in the <clears throat> not very much time I've got, but um, there's one thing that comes before all of it, and that's the book that I've done the most work on. I brought my translation of it with me today, just in case I need to refer to it in the questions. And that's called The Confessions. It's his most famous writing, and it's absolutely unique in the history of all the literature that's ever been written in Europe. I can't speak for world literature because I haven't read it all, but I know that within the European tradition, it stands front and centre. It's a book that's never not been read since the day that it was written. And why is it special? It's special because it's none of those things that I just told you about, except that it's about the truth. Because 
I get a bit sad when I'm reading Augustine's theology. When I see him as a bishop, which he never wanted to be, by the way, he thought being a bishop was a lousy job and that nobody sensible would want it. And he actually got tricked into becoming Bishop of Hippo, which is a bit like becoming um, Bishop of Bognor Regis or something like that. It's just not a sexy place. <laughs> and there he was. He was stuck there for the rest of his life because once you were a bishop somewhere, you didn't move. And he accepted that as God's will. But... I think it made him miserable. And some of his theology is a struggle. It's a struggle because you read in it a man who finds it difficult to endure some of the stuff that bishops had to do in those days, which was about um, intervening in disputes between Christians and deciding who got to live or die in courts and things like that. It was, it was a tough job. And it didn't leave a lot of time for Bible study or prayer. I don't know how he managed. But in Confessions, he, he wrote it 10 years after his conversion, but before he became this grand, important um, spiritual leader in the church. In Confessions, he strips away all the stuff about responsibilities, obligations, all the things that bind us to the earth when we become adults as Christians. Our obligations to one another within the faith community, our obligations to our friends, to our family, all that. It's not about any of that. It is about, as he would say in the text, me and you. It's about him as an individual human being and God. And in all the works that precede it, in Greek and Latin culture and literature, there is nothing like it. I've read quite a lot of them and I've enjoyed the literature a lot. Livy and Cicero and Virgil and Homer and all the rest of it. But I never felt that I met the person, ever. You don't meet the person, you meet their creation, but you don't meet them. Not with Augustine. With Augustine, you are entering into the interior life of the mind. The kind of things that you think about, that you're probably thinking about now while I'm talking. How does this relate to me? Or when's she going to stop talking so I can ask a question? Or whatever it is, there's an internal dialogue that goes on in all our heads all the time. But we don't share it with anybody except God occasionally. And that's what Augustine did in Confessions. It's quite extraordinary. So I'll give you one word of advice if you want to uh, dip into Confessions and read it for yourself. Um, don't be put off at the beginning by the fact it's got lots of scripture quotes in it. Because when Augustine gets extremely emotional about how he loves God, he'll put, he won't speak in his own words always. He'll sometimes use words of scripture. And I tend to skip those bits when I'm not reading seriously because I want to know what he thinks. I already know what the Bible thinks. I want to meet the man. So I would suggest don't be put off by that. Just keep reading and you will meet this extraordinary person who can become not just a teacher, he's not just a teacher to me, he's a friend. And I remember him in my prayers every Sunday when I take communion because he asked me to. If you get to the end of Confessions, when he talks about the death of his mother, he says, um, I hope that my brothers and people who read my book here will um, pray for my mother Monica and for her husband Patricius because that's the last gift he can offer them. So I thought, that's a fair deal. He's given me so much, I'll do that for him. And so I do. In Confessions, we are not meeting the grand, important public figure. We are meeting, in a sense, we're meeting ourselves. Um, he's not different from us just because he was clever or he lived a long time ago. He's just like us because he struggles with the same questions about morality and ethics and about the existence of God and the meaning of life and evil um, and about free will and predestination or about human society. It's all there um, in his exploration with God. Now, I, I thought it might be helpful because um, I find that when I go away from a talk thinking, wow, I'm hopeful here. Wow, that was really interesting. I must find out more about Augustine. I instantly forget everything that I've heard because I've reached that age when my memory just doesn't work anymore. Um, and that's why I, I've got this prepared for you, um, which you're welcome to leave behind if it's not your cup of tea. But if it is, please take it away. And um, there won't be time to go through it today, but I hope it'll whet your appetite for learning more about the man. 
Um, and I wouldn't mind betting that it's the stuff he talks about in his childhood which will press the most buttons for you, which is why I've put that down um, on the front of the sheet. I've just said you'll see the little headings, the pressures of family, turbulent adolescence, and then stealing pears. Nothing sounds more trivial than the stealing pears, and let me tell you, nothing turns out to be more important and significant in his spiritual journey. Life for Augustine was quite comfortable. He was brought up in a respectable, ordinary, boring sort of household. His mother was a Christian and his father was um, a pagan who converted to Christianity just before he died. I think his wife must have nagged him into it because she certainly nagged his son. Um, she's a difficult woman, Monica, but she had her own problems, so we, you know, we mustn't judge. So he was brought up in this comfortable family and he was brought up to expect um, a respectable career and a good job at the end of it and a marriage and children because that's what people wanted in those days. It's not so different from what we want now. And he was partly okay with that, but there was also a big element in his life which was not okay with that, which was not interested in what we might call the things of this world because he was driven by this inner voice that said to him, Life has got to be about more than this. This cannot be all there is. I need to understand what matters. And so he tried it out. He tried my, my good friend, I should like to call him Cicero, uh, that great orator of the ancient world. And he found lots of wisdom in Cicero, um, but it wasn't right for him. And he tried a form of religion called Manichaeism, uh, which was a bit better because it seemed to have some kind of esoteric or spiritual side to it which you don't get in classics, um, but that wasn't right either. And he kept on looking and he could not convince himself that he'd found the truth, and indeed he hadn't. But in fact, what was going on was a really big struggle between the person he wanted to be and the person he knew he ought to be. And if that sounds familiar, I'm not surprised because I think that's something we all encounter. He wanted to be clever, successful, respected, famous. That was just as big a catch in those days as it is in our time. He wanted all those things. He wanted a normal family life, a wife and children. He had a life partner. She's usually called, if you read the stories about Augustine, he, she's usually called um, his concubine, which is a Latin word meaning bed partner. And that means somebody who was born in the wrong rank of society. They couldn't actually marry. There was no legal form for him to marry her, but they lived together and they went through a form of connection to one another and he loved her with all his heart. They had a son together. It was a big giveaway that their son was called Ardeodatus, which means given by God. That's a bit of a giveaway. I think God was always in there as part of the equation. And he thought he could only be happy with the kind of family relationships um, that he experienced with that concubine whose name we don't know. But something was pulling him in another direction and he couldn't fight against it. He didn't really try, but he couldn't fight against it. Uh, and there came a time when he was, I think what we would call it, we'd call it a breakdown. He found himself in a garden with his friend Olypius, just in a state of utter desperation that he did not know how to live his life. He did not know what to choose. And it's something that I myself have found um, you know, obviously personally it speaks to me, but in my job as a, um, a pastor to young people in the university, they are at a stage of life that Augustine reached, where they're having to make choices, they're having to leave the safe world where you're, you're sort of just passing through your three years or four years at uni, and suddenly they've got to find a job and a house. They've got to be grown up and sensible and pay gas bills and stuff like that, and suddenly it all becomes really difficult because they think, is this it? Is this what my life is going to be? And it shouldn't just be about gas bills and jobs. We all know deep down that we, we have these talents and capacities and questioning that make us what the Bible would call um, little lower than the angels. And that's not um, hubris, that's not vanity on our part. That's simply what we're taught to believe. We ought to trust that we are special and that we matter and that not one hair of our head falls to the ground. 
apart from our father. And Augustine believed that with his intellect, but he hadn't yet learned to believe it with his heart. And that's why he came so close to this breakdown. And he, he was lying on the ground in the garden in desperation when he hears that voice saying, pick it up and read it, pick it up and read it. And he thinks, whose voice is that? Can it be a, can it be a child next door? But no, there isn't a child next door. And no, what, why would somebody say something like that? I haven't just misheard or anything. And he went back indoors and he did what people do with their Bibles. I bet you've all done it. He picked up his Bible and flipped it open to see where it opened, where his eye fell. If you haven't, it's worth a try. You get some interesting answers. And his eye felt, fell on take no thought for the flesh. Uh, he suddenly realised, reading St Paul, that what he had to do was to put away licentiousness and what the old translation calls rioting, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. And suddenly the crisis melted away and he was set, left in this state of utter relief that finally he knew where his life was going. It's an incredibly moving and exciting story and much better when he tells it than when I tell it because what we all do, when, like when we listen to the Bible, we bring ourselves to it. You will find yourself in his story, I promise you. Um, but what I want to spend the last 10 minutes that I've got sharing with you is some of the things that he says about prayers and prayer. Because, you know, I could tell you about his view of why God is three persons and one substance and stuff like that, and some of you might even be interested, but, um, that's really difficult to describe and explain and justify in the course of five minutes. But in a sense, anybody who comes to this talk, I'm, I'm guessing pretty much all of us are going to be in one way or another experts in prayer. We probably don't feel like experts, but if you've been doing it for a long time and if you've done it on your own and done it in church, you're an expert. And that's what um, I think it will be helpful if you, if you don't mind turning to the third page just take a look at what he says about prayer. It's what I've labelled number three. Now, I'm not going to read all these out for you because I always find that very annoying when people do it in talks. And I, the point is not that you listen to me reading Augustine, but that, that uh, you take this away and think about Augustine. I'm just going to put a couple of ideas before you that perhaps we can talk about. One is that we are not very good at learning to pray. And I think that's got a lot to do with the fact that the church isn't very good at teaching us. The reason I think is because most of us get our models for how to pray from being in church at services, when the whole congregation is praying to God together, or perhaps a priest is doing it on our behalf or a reader or some other minister is doing it on our behalf. And, and that's, there's nothing wrong with that. Augustine did that every day of his life. And, he tells us almost nothing about his worshipping life because that's too secret and private um, and people didn't talk about it to outsiders so um, we don't really know a lot of it but we have to reconstruct it from sources it's quite tricky but we know that he prayed and he used set forms of prayer just like we do in church and some of them were pretty close to what we use today not surprising at all but what we don't do now, and it wasn't easy to do then, until you get to Augustine's Confessions, was to connect up the prayer that we pray corporately with the prayer that we pray privately. How do those two relate to one another? Because if the only way we learn to pray is through um, church services and things, it's gonna be really difficult. You might learn, Almighty God, you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. But you won't learn ways of feeling comfortable in God's presence when there's nobody else there or being able to talk to him or not talk to him and just be in his presence and what we get in this section three I've given you is first of all him talking to God about prayer describing to God how it feels when he prays and I know this is setting the bar pretty high because Augustine did have visions of God himself He's very, very cautious in confessions about telling us what he sees and how much he sees. But he does tell us that he has been in the divine presence through prayer. 
Um, I'm afraid I can't claim a like holiness, but um, it's still good to read about how he experienced it. And he gives us these descriptions in those first three paragraphs. I, I think of the three of them. Um, the third is the one that I like the best because it's so simple. He says that the light, the divine light is like oil on water. Um, it just floats there and it was greater than that because it made me and I was a lesser because I was its creation. Now to me, and I don't think this is just wishful thinking because I work on him, to me these are the words of somebody who shows absolute authenticity in his faith. I don't have any doubt in my mind that he was thinking, oh this is the kind of thing I should be writing if I want to get a better bishopric or anything like that. He's just telling us how he feels about God. And what I've given you at the end, which again, I, there really isn't time for me to talk through, are three prayers that he actually prayed in the course of confessions. One begins, O eternal truth, true love, and beloved eternity. One is the most famous of the three, late have I loved you, O beauty so old and so new. And the third one, which is my favourite, O truth, light of my heart, do not let my darkness speak to me. And if you want prayers to say, it's, I don't know about you, but I find it really difficult to read prayers out of books because it, prayer means this normally. And if you're trying to read it out of a book, you're usually doing that and trying to do both at the same time. And it's quite tough. But when I read these words and read them slowly and just let them flow through my mind, I find myself getting a little bit of a glimpse of what it was that Augustine experienced and saw. And again, I would suggest to you, I mean, you could read this quite cynically and think he's just talking about how he thinks it ought to feel. But I can't help thinking myself like a scholar. And I'm thinking when I read a text like Late Have I Loved You, or Beauty So Old and So New, when I read that, I'm thinking, right, what's like it already? What's he modelling himself on? Because any act of creative writing in his world is modelled on something else. Is he drawing on the Psalms, on the other bits of scripture? Is he drawing on classical poetry? And I, look, I, I run it through my mind and I think, no, he's not, running, he's not taking this from anywhere. There isn't anything like it anywhere. This has all come out of his own acts of prayer and conversation with God, which is mind-blowing. You know, it's, it's like being Isaac Newton, um, just sort of seeing about the refraction of light in a prism or just realising what gravity is. Um, th I'm not, not saying he didn't do a long lot of mathematics as well, but, but he had the clarity of vision to put that in words that made sense of the experience, that it described it properly. And these are the, I mean, there's loads of prayers you can find from the ancient world. There's prayers in scripture, there's prayers in the church fathers, there's lots and lots of, of scraps of Eucharistic prayers and things like that, that some of our own modern ones are modelled on. But there's nothing like these, and these are like the kind of prayers that I think real people really pray. They're quite extraordinary. They express a sense of need, a sense of unworthiness, but not a sense of worthlessness. And that, I think, is the key thing. Augustine knows how far he's fallen short of the glory of God. But he also knows that it's that understanding that he isn't perfect, that there's nothing that he can do to deserve it, that makes him a beloved child of God. And that's why, for me, um, he is the best model I know for how to learn to pray. Um, something I often talk to people about, um, I often talk to students who are looking to uh, explore their prayer lives. And students particularly find words helpful um, because having something to follow means that you can use it as a springboard and you can, you're not supposed to be confined by those words, you're supposed to go out and find your own. And, um, and they do, because these words speak to everybody, I think, who reads them. I must be honest, it might be possible that some of you think, well, I tried that and it didn't really work for me. Um, and if that's the case and you find other writers and other thinkers more helpful in your Christian journey, that's absolutely fine. I'm not saying that everybody um, has to follow the Augustinian model, but I would say to you that outside the Bible itself, if you want a Christian teacher who can help you on your journey and help you to understand who you are 
and how you relate to God, then Augustine is a really good place to start. I think I'd better stop there, hadn't I? Well, yeah, I, I wish there was a really noble and inspiring answer to this, but there isn't. Um, firstly, um, I avoided him, actually for exactly the same, this is embarrassing, I hadn't thought of it like that, I avoided Augustine for exactly the same reasons um, that he avoided Christianity, because he thought it, it wasn't proper Latin. And I'd been brought up on classical Latin, which has very elegant and, and artistic ways of framing itself. And I looked at Augustine and I thought, well, this isn't the kind of Latin I've learned. I don't want to read this. Uh, so I was a bit off, put off it to start with. And then I was asked to do some lectures in Cambridge um, for the early Christian history course. Uh, and I had to teach a session on confessions and a session on his book on how to teach Christianity, which is what I'm working on at the moment, actually, because I'm on sabbatical. Um, and I fell in love with him because everybody does who reads the confessions. Uh, if you can get past the sort of, there's a torrent of rhetorical questions and scripture in, in the very opening of it. I mean, if you get past that, you're suddenly into the most extraordinary description. I've already, I won't tell you it all again, you've heard it. So of course, I, I had my own little conversion moment with Augustine and realized that I'd been incredibly stupid to cut myself off from this. Um, and it's, it's been no looking back since then. I just can't get enough of him. So. Um, I think you've answered your own question. I would start by reading Confessions uh, because it's the most appealing. Uh, it's very personal, which I think appeals to us nowadays. I mean, all that you know, theology trying to come to the right answer to make all the maths add up, and, you know, it's not, not necessarily what we want to hear. Um, I don't think I don't take my Trinitarian faith seriously, but I'm not sure how much of it works on paper. Um, I think if you read the actual text of Confessions, um, it will just happen that you fall in love with him. Um, in terms of which is the best translation, um, that's a very personal choice. I've written a translation which tries to be as... Um, which comes with the Latin next to it, and it tries to be as... Um, give you as much of a flavour of what it's like to read the original as you possibly can in English. But there are other translations which are more approachable than that. I know that, um, that Rowan Williams would recommend, um, oh, what's her name, Mariah Bolding, who's a, a religious somewhere, I, I think American, and she's written a really good one, but you, I don't think it's in print now, but you can find it on ABE books and all that kind of thing. Um, I wouldn't myself recommend Mr. Pine Coffin's Penguin translation. Um, there really is somebody called Mr. Pine Coffin. <laughs> you couldn't make it up. Um, I, I don't like that particularly myself. Um, and I think um, Edward Pusey, the great Anglo-Catholic scholar, wrote one which is very old-fashioned now, but is also um, one of the best known. And it gives you a sense of the grace and majesty of some of it. But it's not always easy to follow. Um, so there are, there are different options. Yeah. Well, this, this book was written, um, I'll get back to the microphone, sorry. Um, I wrote this for the Bible Reading Fellowship. Um, and I was, like a lot of the things I write, in fact, almost all of them, I wrote it because somebody asked me to write it rather than having a, a bright idea. And a bit like this, the Bible Reading Fellowship wanted to have um, a little library of Christian thinkers for people to take their faith in different directions. Uh, now, the, I don't know if any of you are members, but the Bible Reading Fellowship um, has a reputation for being really rather a, um, a sort of old-fashioned Protestant kind of society. The Bible is the key thing for them, so even doing something like this is a bit unusual. Um, but the reason it was so nice to be asked was because what that said to me was um, they think I can talk to people about Augustine in ways that aren't going to mystify them. Um, and that's what I've tried to do. It's a study guide, this one. Uh, so if you want to learn about his life and the things that he dealt with in the course of that life, the, you know, the, the really lovely one-to-one -one with God stuff in confessions, the how to pray stuff that's in there, and then the tough stuff about 
doctrinal disagreements in the church with all the schismatic groups and the heretics and all the rest of it, that's in there as well. And um, how to get past um, family obligations and think about your own relationship with God, uh, which spoke to me at a time in my life that mattered a lot. Um, so I was trying to do it in really approachable ways. And, you know, there's a passage of scripture and a prayer and some questions. Um, so it's designed really for people to, to do as a group or as individuals. But it's meant to be helpful because it, it gives you a, a sort of a jargon free introduction because there's an awful lot of stuff written about Augustine and quite a lot of it is a, is a bit sick making really. Um, <laughs> So English scholars who write about Augustine tend to be really excited by any proof at all that he wasn't really a Christian, he was actually a Neoplatonist or something like that, because you know, it's a bit like trying to, trying to wish T.S. Eliot had never become a Christian, because that kind of spoiled the poetry. That's the English scholars' approach, and then the French scholars are all Jesuits, so they've got their own take, and all their books are printed on Saint Augustine, not just Augustine, so they're kind of answering their own question before they start. Um, so to have something that's free of all that, I think that was the most important thing, that people could just um, get to know the man. Right, well, the first thing to say is, um, I assure you that the lady in green is not a plant in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> because I couldn't have put it better myself. Um, of course it's rhetorical. In fact, it's so rhetorical that if you were to flick through my, do come and have a look later, uh, through my own translation, which is all written in prose, when you get to that bit, I've asked for it to be printed in verse form because he's writing it. I think, I think the model he's got in his mind is a psalm because the psalms are written what we call antiphonately. You know, um, um, wait a minute. What a, I lift up mine eyes unto the hills, from whence cometh my help. My help cometh even from the Lord, who hath made heaven and earth. He shall not suffer thy foot to be moved, and he that keepeth his shall not sleep. That's what we call antiphonal, because it's sung from one side of the choir and then the other. And that's exactly what he's doing in Late Have I Loved You. And you're right, he was, he was a professor of rhetoric. He was well chuffed when he got his job in um, Milan to be the professor of rhetoric there. And he left Carthage, got away from his mother and legged it to Milan and started teaching. And he was very, very um, proud of being a, a rhetorician. And later, of course, very sorry that he'd thought that that was more important than God. But what you've correctly identified is that he never stopped being a rhetorician. Um, rhetoric in, in the ancient world is the art of persuasive speech. It's something that I think almost all our modern politicians have no clue whatsoever about because they can't speak publicly for toffee. And um, as we've been recently reminded, perhaps, on, on both sides of the house, let me say, um, I don't want to be controversial, but in the ancient world, if you couldn't speak in public, there wasn't another means. You know, people didn't have books li like this. Um, and if anybody who did have books would either be a library or a very, very rich person indeed. And even they didn't have very many each. They used to co copy them around and share them. Um, but the art of persuasive speech was how you reached people. And when you taught, you taught in a conversational form like this. And so um, it was a skill that he knew was incredibly valuable, not just to him as a pagan teacher of rhetoric, uh, because that's where the money was. You know, it was the subject everyone wanted to study because it would make them rich, like medicine at Cambridge. Um, he, he also realized, and this was something he found much more difficult, and that's what I'm working on right now, is that, that the church needs rhetoric. The church is stuffed with it. You know, we, we can't go to a service without hearing a multi-syllabic and many-clawed sentence telling us about the nature of God. Um, and, and so what he tries to argue in this later book, which is full of fun things like why um, taking the Bible literally is nuts, um, that's a very important argument, but perhaps for another time. Um, all of it literally, I mean, not some of it. Um, what he's trying to do in this later work is to say rhetoric is the Christian teacher's friend because there is nothing that we can learn which is not evil in itself that cannot be put to the good purpose of spreading the word. And let's face it, I, I think um, your canon chancellor will back me up on this, that St Paul was an extraordinary rhetorician. And once or twice in, in my time writing a column for the Church Times, I've alerted readers to a passage of St Paul where he is using artistic speech 
He's not just saying, oh, you know, do this to God and then do that with your neighbour and pop a bit of this in the plan with your family. He's saying things that are are one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all. That's rhetoric. Um, And it's quite sexy when you know that in the Greek, it's haste mea hen. It goes through all the different forms of the word one so that you've got the whole set in in one expression. It's brilliant. Um, And yeah, Augustine was fantastic at that. But don't think the Bible isn't stuffed full of rhetoric too. (laughs) Uh, a lot of, there's lots of it, um, and it, he didn't think that, ret- this, is the, this is the key bit, we think that when someone's trying to persuade us of something, that it's probably a lie, and I think that's because we're exposed to advertising all the time. It's trying to sell us something which we wouldn't buy if we didn't watch the advert, whereas Christian rhetoric is trying to sell us something which is really important for us to know, but sometimes Christian truth is not very appealing, and it needs a little bit of if you like, the, the rhetoric in Be- Be- Late of I Loved You it is the honey on the spoon to make the medicine go down. That's using a classical metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the short answer is he does. Um, he writes, not in the books that I've referred to here, uh, but he does write uh, about the... He, only within marriage, that's a, that's a Christian norm in his time. Within marriage, sex between a husband and wife is a good thing. And when he wrote that book on the good of marriage, it was incredibly controversial because most people in the church in the fourth and fifth centuries thought that the virginity was the best thing since sliced bread. And if you've got that, you've got everything. You were at least 10 steps ahead of everybody else on the spiritual purity scale. And Augustine comes along and says, no, actually, Sex between men and women is God-given and it's divinely uh, instituted. It's part of God's purposes. Uh, And that was quite, um, it wasn't completely unheard of, but it was unusual. And actually to say that in a a work of theology that people published and people, everything he wrote, people wrote it down and passed it round. So, you know, it was was meant for publication. That was a big step forward. When I say he's anti-sex, part of what you have to understand is that this is a a facet of his personality. It's not that he thought sex was a bad thing per se, but that he was one of those people, I'm sure we've either been with them or met them, who can't go half in, half out. If he was going to be a Christian, he was going to be that kind of a Christian. Um, And for him, it came down to a choice to be either Um, a teacher of rhetoric with a wife and family, or a Christian monk, somebody whose life was focused entirely on God and didn't have time for the other stuff because he felt that dividing himself up would would make it impossible for him to live the kind of Christian life he wanted to. And I think we might argue with that model today um, because we've got a much less negative understanding of sex than people did in those days. I think I'm afraid it all comes down to the virginal conception, and that's a, a, another can of worms. But, um, but he wasn't anti-sex per se, and he certainly wasn't a sexist. Um, if, again, another good reason to read the Confessions is that when he talks about his mother, who I've referred to rather disparagingly, but she was a wonderful woman, um, and don't take this the wrong way, he says that she had uh, an intelligence and understanding the equal of any man. And he said it with a tone of surprise because that would have knocked everybody for six in his day. But it was absolutely obvious to him that she was just as clever as he was and just as spiritual. Um, And in fact, they have this incredible, I call it a double vision. The two of them have a vision of God together, which I don't think is paralleled anywhere in Christian literature of any kind. Um, So I would say um, that he doesn't have a negative attitude to sex or especially not to marriage Um, and you have to remember that unlike a lot of those church fathers who were writing about the evils of sex and the wonders of virginity Augustine had actually done it Um, and he got a child from a loving relationship with a woman who meant a great deal to him and he you know what I said about him loving the truth above all things He was never going to say that was evil because his own experience told him there was something in that that was good. That's really encouraging. He's not got the whole way, but, you know, it's pretty good for the fourth century. (laughs) I think he'd say, and this is a very Latin joke, sorry, folks, salvate fratres. (laughs) 
Hail brothers, that's what he'd say, because he'd recognise that we and he are the same. That would be the first thing. Um, he was talking in Latin. We don't know if he ever spoke anything other than Latin, actually. That's a side issue, because um, he's North African, um, and his mother was a Berber, which is not a black African um, nationality, but it's something to do with, mixed up with the origins of Arab peoples, I think. But uh, anyway, the, the point is that he, he wasn't a European. Um, it, but he, so we think he must have spoken Punic and Berber, but there's not a single word of it. He only hear him speak in Latin. Um, I think he would have been very surprised uh, at some elements of what we do. He'd be surprised at how open we are and welcoming, because in his day, anybody who wasn't a baptised Christian wouldn't have been allowed to come to the Eucharist here at St Paul's or anywhere else. You'd be allowed to sit through the, the sermon, um, everything up to the sermon, and then you'd be taken out and then the proper Christians would stay on for the end of it. That's what everybody did back then. I think you'd been staggered to realise that we all mingle together and that there was a thing called a blessing for people who hadn't you know, taken the plunge and got baptised. That would have surprised him a lot. I think he'd been utterly stunned by people like me <laughs> and Paula. <laughs> don't think he'd know what to make of us. But I, I reckon because he's so clever and so honest that if he saw that it worked, and it would have been okay. I think I've put it on the sheet somewhere, but one of my favourite sayings of his comes from this work that I'm studying at the moment. Um, and I've used it often for people who think that Augustine would have been, oh, this is terrible, you know, these people are living such immoral lives, not like in the good old days, because actually there were no good old days and his church was just as riven with immorality and bickering as ours is. Um, his take on how to understand things in Christianity is, and then he's talking particularly about the Bible, any interpretation of the Bible which is not consonant with the love of God and neighbour cannot be correct. Any teaching uh, or any interpretation of the Bible which is not consonant with the love of God and neighbour cannot be correct. And I've found that to be very wise. He might not think that the that we're identifying the same problems as he is. Um, you know, for example, I would take something like um, the sayings in the Bible about uh, God finding homosexuality to be um, an evil, if that's what it does say in the Bible. I would say that that can't be simply and un uncontextualised the right reading because it's not consonant with the love of God and neighbour. Now, he might have had a different take on that. I don't know. It's not something he talks about very much. But it's, what he's given us there is what, what we scholars call a hermeneutical principle. You can apply that principle to anything and it will help you to understand it. It's brilliant. And so I think he would have looked around at us in our strange world with our strange mediums of communication and thought, if it's not consonant with love of God and neighbour, it can't be right, but this looks consonant with it, so it probably is. He's a very wise man, mostly. <laughs>
because it always does, because most of us are interested in where we come from and what our parents are. So I think he would have been interested by that. He didn't have any... Um, he, he never expresses pride in his Berber origins. And, and as I say, he, we don't have any words of his that show that he spoke Punic, which is the, the language of North Africa or, or Berber either. But he must have understood it a bit, because when he called his son... Um, he called his son Arde Adatus. That's a, what we call a calc. It's a translation of a Hebrew, uh, of a Punic name, sorry. And it, uh, it means Yatan Bahal. It, it means that God has given. Um, like the Baal bit in the name Hannibal, because Hannibal came from Carthage. I mean, it's, a, it's all mixed up in North Africa. So there's a proud heritage to the Punic people and their names and um, their history and so on. And that is part of his life that he doesn't talk about. Now, whether that's because he's embarrassed by it, because what he wanted to do was get away from North Africa and go to Rome, where the bright city lights were, um, like perhaps like Liz Truss, <laughs> leaving the north of England and finding the truth in London or something, I don't know. Um, lots of people do that. Um, he, there wasn't really a kind of movement in the ancient world to be proud of your origins which other people look down on, um, which I think is a thing for us. I know as somebody who's um, born of a Welsh mother that I come from a, a nationality which was looked down on as stupid in former generations. Um, in my mother's time, you could be told off for, writing, for speaking Welsh in school, you could be beaten for it or sent home. Um, whereas now Welsh people are very proud of their heritage and they emphasise it, but that didn't really happen in Augustine's day. Um, you know, if you wanted to get on up and get rich and succeed and be famous, you did it in Latin. 